Welcome! This webinar is brought to you by the New Hampshire Training Institute on Addictive Disorders. You can access the recording of this webinar on our website at www.nhadaca.org within our webinar, webinar library. After completing this webinar, please complete the quiz and evaluation if you're interested in receiving a certificate. You can find the quiz and evaluation on our website next to the Watch Now button you selected to view this webinar. If you're a member of NAHATICA or NADAC, the certificate for this webinar is free. If you're not a member, the fee is $15. You will receive a certificate worth one CE once you have completed the evaluation, passed the quiz, and paid for the webinar, if applicable. Through the New Hampshire Training Institute on Addictive Disorders, this one-hour event is pre-approved by the New Hampshire Board of Licensing for Alcohol and Other Drug Use Professionals, as well as NBCC, ACEP number 6754. If you're having trouble viewing the webinar, audio problems, or have technical questions, please contact us at 603-225-7060. Please email any questions regarding the material you see today to training at nhadaca.org. So let's jump in to our next core function, which is number nine, and that's client education. This is a very short um, core function, one of the shorter ones of all 12, um, but it just happens to be probably one of my favorites and probably one of the most misunderstood as well. Um, I think people who are training to become clinicians or clinicians already tend to think that all they do is counseling. And the reality is you probably do education, I would say 85 to 90% of the time. So you're really doing a large portion of education, whether you're doing one-on-one -on -one sessions, whether you're running a group, whether you're running an intensive outpatient program, client education runs through all of our work. So um, if you've been following my series, you know a little bit about me. So, um, but for those of you who are new, uh, my name is uh, Kelly Ledke. I'm a professor at, well, a few different colleges, but my full-time role is I am professor and program coordinator for the Addiction Counseling Program at NHTI in Concord. I have my master's in education counseling, and I also have my CAGS in mental health counseling, and I am a master level licensed alcohol and drug counselor in the state of New Hampshire. Um, a little bit about my background is I've got my um, bachelor's in psychology, and I got that from UNH Durham, and I went on to receive my master's in education counseling at UNH Durham as well. And um, what I realized after I got my master's, I started working um, with people who were suffering with addiction concerns. And what I realized, because um, shortly after my master's, I got my LADAC, and I was only competent legally to treat people with alcohol and drug um, concerns only. So meaning I was having probably, I mean, I didn't keep statistics on this, but I would say just from my own professional experience, I was seeing clients, probably 90% of them were coming in with not only an alcohol and drug um, concern, but also a mental health concern. So they were struggling with like, let's say um, alcohol use, and also at the same time were experiencing symptoms of anxiety or depression. So it was very, very common. And the concern that came up for me was that um, I couldn't treat 
the depression or the anxiety. Now I had a master's degree, so I had been trained to do that, but competently, legally, because I was a LADAC, I could only treat the substance use disorder. So it, it felt frustrating to me that I, I could get, you know, to treat people with alcohol disorders, but yet when I saw the symptoms of depression or anxiety or, or other things coming up, I had to refer them to a mental health counselor. And it frustrated me because I'm sure some of you have heard me say this before, it's hard enough to get a client to keep coming back for counseling sessions sometimes because um, it can be really hard to face your disorders, your issues. And let's face it, sometimes it's just easier to use. So, you know, to keep them coming to just this one appointment with me was often struggle enough. And then on top of it, now I had to tell them, okay, you're going to keep coming to your appointment with me for your alcohol use but I'm gonna send you down the road to the mental health center for your depression symptoms or your anxiety symptoms or both. And it really became my experience anyway that clients either A, gave up on working with me, B, gave up working um, with their mental health, and C, the worst, they gave up counseling altogether. It became too much. It became too overwhelming. And I understood that. I mean, I really, really got that. And um, I would try and talk to my clients and really make these seamless, um, great referrals where like all they had to do was show up. I would do all the, you know, calls beforehand or I'd let the client make calls with me. So everything was set up for them. But I got it. You know, on some level, it's just too much. It's too many appointments. It's too much stuff coming up. Um and it just, I guess for a lot of my clients, the feedback was it just didn't, it didn't feel right. It didn't feel safe enough to have two different counselors, right? And then they also felt like they were retelling their story over and over again to two different people. So I totally got that, it frustrated me. And I thought, okay, you know, what am I going to do? And right around this time is when the MLAID Act came to New Hampshire. So I thought, this is brilliant, right? I have my master's. I have the hours. Um, so I did go back and get my certified advanced degree, um, to brush up on the mental health piece of things, because again, I had been working in addiction now for a few years. And, um, so I got the advanced degree, got my master's up to a 60 credit hour master's and applied for the MLADAC. And then once I had the MLADAC, I was able to treat the addiction and the mental health, a co-occurring piece, um, and not have to send my clients out to a referral if I, you know, notice the symptoms of a mental health issue. So um, it's really, I guess that's, it's not really a plug for the MLADAC, but I can tell you um, it certainly would behoove you um, to look at that and, um, you know, or, you know, where you work, having a mental health clinician, if you're a LADAC, have a mental health clinician um, on site is really helpful because then at least they're just in the same building. And then the coordination of services is a lot easier too. Um, but definitely something to think about because that's how it is today. Um, if you have your LADAC in New Hampshire, you're able to only treat the substance use disorder. Um, but if you have your MLADAC, you can treat the co-occurring. So um, a little bit about my professional history is I've done just about every single job there is in substance use. Um, you know, I started as a clinician and loved the work. And what's interesting about that is my, in my master's level internship was working with people with substance use disorders. And that was not what I had set out to do. Right. Um, when I went to get my master's degree, I just wanted to be a therapist. And um, when I went through my degree, that's what I was trained for. I had received zero, zero training in substance use through my, my graduate program, through my master's program. And um, it wasn't even offered as an elective. When I went to get my CAGS, there was a substance use class offered as an elective. 
And I took it because I was curious, you know, and it's funny because the professor had said to me after you could have taught this class. And I thought to myself, I should have taught this class because I had more qualifications than the person standing in front of the room. So the reality is, if you get a substance use class offered at a college, seldom is it taught by a LADAC or an MLADAC who probably has all that great experience to be teaching that. So um, it was a real eye opener. And so I continued to um, do my internship with substance use, but that's not what I had set up to do. They just, I hate to say it, but I think back then, and I don't, I'm not sure if it really goes on enough today, but back then they put the interns to work with people that they didn't want to work with. And so nobody in the office that I did my internship at wanted to deal with the people who had the substance use issues, right? They always talked about, um, you know, my clients as sort of the lying, cheating, stealing population. They weren't to be trusted. Um, they, they were seen as almost less than the other clients that came through. And um, that was my first sort of um, experience with stigma and discrimination. Um, but I continued to work with them and really liked the population, loved the subject. Um, so I continued to do that. And then I worked with college students. Um, so I continued to work in colleges as a clinician. And then um, I, got, I got kind of tired. I wanted to see what, what else was out there. I wanted to make a little bit more money. Um, so I went into administration. I became clinical director of a large treatment facility in New Hampshire and I enjoyed it a little bit because I felt like I had more power for policy change, which was really great. Um, but it was a lot of paperwork and a lot of meetings. And I really felt like I lost touch with working with, with people, right? Working with the clients. So um, I was about to leave the profession altogether. Because I was like, well, if I'm not going to be a clinician and I'm not going to be like an administration what else is there to do in substance use? So I actually started looking at like leaving the program altogether, like leaving the profession altogether. And um, <clears throat> then I can't remember how it happened, but um, I found out about a professor, professor position at NHTI in the addiction counseling program. And I thought to myself, well, it's back in education, which I love. It's back working with college students, which I love. And it's in my profession. I know addiction counseling, right? So I thought, okay, I'm just going to apply for this job. And if it works, it works. And if it doesn't, I'm not meant to be in the profession. So luckily it worked. And I've been there ever since. Um, so this is my, I'm working on my ninth year at an HTI and super happy and thrilled. I mean, it's just... It's right where I need to be. I also do um, adjunct work at Southern New Hampshire University, and I teach in their addiction counseling program and their human service program. And my third job is I'm an adjunct professor um, for psychology in the undergraduate department at New England College, and I love it. I just, just love it. So um, as you can see, my background's in psychology, uh, that's where I fell in love. So, and then I, I got like a new world of addiction um, by chance. I, it's not something I signed up for. It just sort of happened. And so I get to marry, um, you know, the substance use piece and the psychology piece together. And I love it. So couldn't be happier. Um, I am, I'm, I, I am a past president of Nahatika, but I'm not the most recent past president of Nahatika, but I've served on the board of directors uh, for Nahatika. I think I served 11 years. So I, I definitely have my roots in Nahatika and, and love and support, um, their projects. And I'm currently the licensing board chair for alcohol and other drug use professionals. That is a job that keeps me super, super busy. Um, and it's a volunteer job. But I love being able to advocate for the profession. And um, I just like, you know, seeing what's new, making the right decisions for the profession, and guiding and leading people um, in this wonderful profession. So that's 
I guess it's not just a little about me. I think it's a lot about me. But hopefully you can see um, the experience is there, the passion is there, and it continues to be there. If um, you need to contact me or want to contact me, if you have any questions, me feel free. My information is here. <clears throat> I'm not in the office. I really haven't been much in the office since COVID. Um, but so I wouldn't call because I won't return your phone call probably for like six months. So <laughs> that's pretty useless. But if you want to email me, that is my direct email at work. You know, go ahead, ask me questions or um, just get in touch with me. I love hearing from you guys. I get all kinds of different emails about different things. It's, occasionally, I'll get a question about the webinar, but most of the time, it's um, how do I get licensed? Or how do I get into the program? How do I excel in my job? You know, all these, and that's okay. I don't mind answering those questions. I'm, I'm happy to answer what I can answer. So feel free. So uh, let's jump into this, client education. Um, so as you know, when you do go to take your LADAC test, um, or even your MLADAC test, you are taking it through the ICNRC, right? That's the International Consortium, um, or Certification and Reciprocity Consortium. It's a mouthful. Well, they're the ones who uh, regulate our licensing. So, um, internet, like they're an international body. So they regulate your testing. So it's very important if you're going to be taking your um, ADC exam for the LADAC and the AADC exam for the MLADAC that you really have a strong understanding of the ICNRC definitions for each of these core functions. I say this at the beginning of every webinar for every core function. So um, this is the part to take note, like take note on this because um, that's what they're going to ask you. You know, if they ask you questions about core functions, which they will somewhere along the way, I think there's like 175 questions, they're going to ask you about the core functions. So um, make sure you know the definitions and uh, the global criteria to go with them. Luckily for you, uh, client education is very short. The definition um, for client education from ICNRC is provision of information to individuals and groups concerning alcohol and other drug. That should say use because that's the new language. So we got to get John Herdman on the new language, but John Herdman still uses abuse. So I didn't want to change anything because it's a direct quote um, and the available services and resources. So essentially, what is that saying? It's saying just you're, you're teaching, you're disseminating information about alcohol and other drugs to people in a variety of different formats. But the important thing to understand is that it's providing information to people concerning alcohol and other drugs and available services and resources. So where can they learn more, right? The global criteria, which is just essentially, if you remember, it's the how you do the core function. So for a global criteria, there's two short ones. The first one is present relevant alcohol and other drug use or abuse information to the client through formal and or informal processes. So you present the education either through a formal or informal process. Um, we'll talk about different um, ways that you can present information, but a lot of the times it could just be a casual conversation. You could be passing good information along. It could be in a group. It could be in a one-on-one -on -one setting. So there's a variety of different ways that you can present the information, and we'll talk about those. The second global criteria is to present information about available alcohol and other drug services and resources. So that's just the last half of the definition of client education. So you're presenting information about different um, addiction or alcohol and other drug services that people could get or resources where they could find out more information about what you're talking, okay, what the topic is. Okay, so let's uh, take a look at breaking down a little bit of this global criteria, which I just kind of did for you, but maybe we could break it down even more because I just know you're going to get tested on this. So I want to make sure you understand it. 
So the first global criteria we talked about <clears throat> is that presenting, right, the alcohol and other drug use information to a client, either through formal or informal processes. So to be really competent in this criterion, you have to know um, a number of relevant methods for educating clients. So I often talk about having like a toolbox. So for whatever reason, in my mind, I'm very visual. What helps me is I think of like a little black doctor's bag. And I always think, keep that filled with relevant resources, tools, things to help clients. Because essentially all you're doing, right, when you're working with a client, you know, you're taking things out of that sort of black bag, you're presenting them on a table for a client, you're explaining what each of those items is, and then, you know, you're allowing the client at that point to ask questions, to um, maybe even try out some of the tools that you're presenting, but ultimately the client is the one who picks the tool at the end of the day and they apply that tool and you help them by, you know, teaching them how to use that tool or checking in with them to make, to see how that tool is working for them. And if it isn't going back to that table that you laid all the tools out on. And again, this is completely figuratively. It's just how I imagine it in my head. Um, and then they go back and they choose another tool. So they keep choosing until they find what works for them best. Um, and then, so once you've, um, once you've presented relevant methods for educating the client, applying them as part of a treatment plan to educate a client about substance use. So any, anything that you've laid out as a tool and they've chosen obviously goes into the treatment plan because you're going to be checking in on it constantly. You're going to be, you know, how's this working for you? Do we need to make any changes within this tool? Do we need to look at a completely different tool because this isn't working for you? So um, making sure you can't, you can't really be asking about things that aren't included in the treatment plan, right? Your treatment plan is your map and your guide, right? You remember that from counseling. So, um, Sometimes a counselor can be skilled in formal education methods, um, such as using films, handouts on substance use issues, uh, lecturing, but most of you are probably not. Right? Most of you didn't go sort of the education route that I went. So some of you might be more familiar with informal methods, um, such as discussions in the counseling session, um, or even use of bibliotherapy. Now, I just a quick comment about bibliotherapy is I feel like um, people have sort of steered away from this because, um, you know, I think sometimes they just think it's like boring. You know, it's, it's boring to just be like, oh, you want to know about that? You should read this book. And then, you know, the clients are like, I'm not going to read a book. And so, <laughs> you know, instead, what you could do, what's bibliotherapy as well, could be just taking a chapter out of a book or take, taking a little bit out of a book and then presenting it and working with the client in a creative way. So that would be more like experience with client education, right? So my background has pretty much been in education since I left my master's program. Right? I've constantly been working with clients in education, been working with them administratively, and then been in the um, world of academia. So, I mean, that's pretty much all I do. So don't be discouraged about bibliotherapy because you think it's like handing over a book to somebody and saying, okay, you're feeling, you know, you want to learn more about uppers, downers, and all-arounders, here's the book, and then just sort of leaving it at that. Right. Um, so some of your clients might be really into that. They might be able to just, you know, gobble up books and they love that. Most of them are not going to be feeling well enough, probably initially in treatment to just devour a book. They might need to take it slower. And maybe you need to come up with a couple of questions for them to journal about from the chapter in the book that you assign. You know, just find creative ways to do bibliotherapy. It doesn't have to be, um, just handing over a book to somebody because I agree. I think that can be really overwhelming and boring. Plus you want to be following up on, um, you know, what they're learning in the book, what the book's discussing. So if you recommend a book, make sure you know the book, 
Make sure you've read the book. Make sure you can ask questions about the book and speak about the topics in the book, right? Don't just recommend something that you've never read because you're not going to be able to, to follow up with that. Okay. The second global criteria is to present information about available alcohol and other drug services and resources. So again, to be competent in this criterion, right, um, you have to know a number of different relevant methods applied as part of the treatment plan. We always connect back to the treatment plan to educate the client about available alcohol and other drug um, services and resources. So again, um, where they can get more treatment or more education on the topic and um, where they could find more on their own. So services and resources um, should always be part of the client's current treatment plan and you um, provide examples of services to the client, maybe even the family or others and identify resources. So you're providing a rationale for why the specific service or resource you're presenting to a client, um, why, why would they need that? Why, what, what's the relevance of it, basically? Um, so you need to have a comprehensive understanding of what's available in your community and um, for resources. I always, I talk more about this when we get to case management, but I think a really good suggestion I have for people, and uh, when I was working in treatment facilities, I would always grab a couple of staff members to do this and work together, but put together like a three ring binder of all the different services and resources that are within the community of the treatment center. So you're, you're obviously not gonna be able to do it for you know, every town in the state of New Hampshire, that would take a really long time. But wherever the client is receiving services, you know, put together where they could get mental health services, where could they get um, veterans benefits, where could they get employment services, where could they get um, shelter services, where can they get um, unemployment benefits, right? Where's the closest VA? So getting together all those community services, getting an address, getting an email, getting a website, getting a phone number, you know, getting as much information, um, particularly around um, the fees, if any, who they serve, right? So somebody who's not a veteran obviously can't go to the VA, but, um, you know, a homeless shelter, is it male only or is it female only? Is it dry? Is it wet? So, you know, knowing as much about the community service that you're presenting in your book um, and then resources to go with that. And that could be anything like online, um, any books, that kind of stuff. But I think, you know, putting together that binder is really important um, because you're going to have so many different things most of you are going to have so many different things. I know there's probably treatment areas that are in the middle of nowhere that aren't, there isn't a lot around you, you know, but if you're looking at a place like, for example, like Farnham Center, right there in the middle of Manchester, New Hampshire, there's quite a few services around there. So, you know, getting a list together and organizing it, you know, with um, headers. Right, so if you wanna know about employment benefits, have a couple resources in there, have some community services that the client and you could contact together. Because let's face it, I mean, our clients don't just come with, you know, an alcohol problem or a drug problem. Usually there's a variety of things because addiction is a social disease as well, right? So, okay. Um, Client education, I've already kind of talked about this, but the point I want to make here is that client education can happen in a variety of different ways and a variety of different formats. And it's, it's really less about what you're teaching sometimes and just the fact that you're teaching, right? We can't, you can't assume that just because somebody's had a history of using alcohol or other drugs that they know all the information about alcohol and other drugs. They can tell you how it makes them feel. They can tell you how to buy it. They can tell you street names and how much it costs and all that kind of stuff. 
but that's not what we're talking about, right? They might have no idea how it impacts their brain. They might not understand that it is a disease. They might not understand that hereditary factor. Um, they might not understand that um, biopsychosocial piece to addiction. That's all stuff you're going to want to educate your client on. So um, typically, if, a, if you work in a residential setting, um, they have a lot of groups all day long. I mean, I don't know. My guess would be anywhere like three to four, probably more groups a day for clients. They're constantly running. It's not that every client has to go to all those groups a day, but um, there's at least three to four running at all times. So clients can pick what they're interested in and attend those. And running a group is a little bit of a different um, beast than doing um, even like it, it's different than doing an individual session, right? Where you're just one on one teaching somebody, but it's also different than IOP because IOP tends to be a little bit of a smaller group, right? There's usually a cap and a limit on how many people um, at, can attend an IOP. Groups are, like I said, you know, when I was working in residential. Clients could drop in all the time. And sometimes we would have 20 plus people in a group. And that's different where an IOP might have seven to 10. So it's, it's, it's um, learning how to manage bigger groups, right? Like none of you will probably do this, but if you teach at the university system an intro to psychology class, you can have 300 kids in there. That's a lot of people to be educating, but you're still, it's still a group. You're still teaching a group. And then you have residential services where you could have 20, 25 people in the room. You have an IOP where you could have, you know, seven to 10, maybe 14 or 15. That's probably max. That seems to be, to me, to be kind of a big IOP. And then you can have just a one-on-one -on -one session, just you and your client. Um, my recommendation to people when they're doing client education, and I'll talk about this in a little bit, but have a plan. Have a plan what you're doing, right? I don't just walk into a classroom and be like, hmm, what am I going to teach today? No, I have like a weekly schedule and, you know, mine might be a little more vague than yours might be. Like I'll say today I'm going to talk about chapter four and that's on existential theory. Well, I I'm versed in that so I can comfortably walk into a room and teach existential theory to people without notes and stuff like that. But if I had to go into a room and teach, um, I don't know, a neuroscience, I wouldn't be as comfortable. I would have to plan out. I would have to say, okay, here's my topic. This is what I want to use for resources. These are the activities I want to do with them. These are the highlights I want to make sure, you know, I'm comfortable talking about. And I would do like my own planning before I walked in there. And so I'm, I'm telling you, I think it's really important when you um, begin education, have a plan. How am I going to do this? What do I want the goals of the group to be? What are the group rules? What are the objectives of the group? What are the activities? Um, what's the plan if somebody gets triggered? Right? Am I going to have another staff member in the room to like help that person leave the room and stay with them while I continue the group? How's that going to go? So have, have a plan. I'll talk about it a little bit more in a minute. <clears throat> but when you're... Oh. Can I go back? <laughs> when designing an educational program, you have to consider the range of problems in the population and the difference in learning ability. This is huge, okay? I need you guys to remember this. I think it's even um, a question on your quiz. So hint, 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 pay attention here. When you're looking at doing a program, you wanna consider What's the topics here? What are the problems that people are going to want to learn about? So in our case, right, it's, it's substance use. But what about substance use? And a fan favorite, um, just for an example, is a lot of people when they're in residential treatment wanted to do some stuff on the brain. They wanted to know how their substance use impacted their brain. So we must have done, I don't even know, how many brain um, education groups in a week because it was just something people really wanted to know. They also wanted to know about the family system, 
right? How that, how addiction impacted that and um, how addiction was hereditary. How did that actually work? And they had a lot of questions about that stuff. So once you know what the range of problems is in the, in the population, you can design what kind of groups you're going to make, right? What do your clients want to know about? And you can do, you know, a pretty easy um, a survey or questionnaire that just says, like, what kind of groups do you guys want to hear about? And they can just write down a couple things that they're interested in. You take a look at their feedback, and it's a great focus group because you've just gotten exactly what they want to hear about, and then you can design your program on that. You have to take into ability, uh, or I'm sorry, take into consideration abilities. And as sad as this was, there was definitely, every time a, a new uh, person came into residential, there was definitely at least one person who couldn't read very well, um, they couldn't write, they had some, um, issues, their learning abilities. Um, sometimes they only had like a sixth grade education. So we had to look at, you know, how do we help people like that get the same information and that same experience of being in a group? Um, while not, you know, while also meeting the needs of other people who didn't have any issues. Um, so you've got to, you've got to know your audience. You've got to know what you're working with. And that can be really hard sometimes, but just doing a little bit of background on people that are going to be, um, coming into group, the clients in your treatment facility, you know, what are some of the things, you know, you should have as sort of a backup, right? Because people, like I said, they might drop into a group. So you might have everybody functioning at this high level. Then you might have somebody come in who's had some, you know, um, maybe some brain damage from their chronic use and what might be a backup you could have for them? Like what kind of learning tools might you have for them so that they can partake in the experience as well? So you, you kind of have to try and factor for a lot of different things that might happen. So it's not easy to manage a group. I mean, it's definitely not. I think about, you know, every time I walk into a classroom of 25 to 30 students, right? I don't have everybody functioning at the same level. I don't know them. I'm just meeting them for the first time. So I have to present information and then I somehow have to get like a, um, like a summative, you know, assessment back. Like, are you guys following this? Are you getting this? Right. And if, you know, the majority of the class isn't, you know, I might have to tweak what I'm teaching or how I'm teaching it. If, you know, one or two don't get it, then I might, you know, have to take them aside and do something one-on-one -on -one with them or figure out a plan with them to help them get that information in a way that makes sense to them, right? So everybody deserves that sort of that fair, equal access to treatment. Okay. So um, the purpose, obviously, of client education is to introduce knowledge in support of the treatment process. You know, knowledge can be um, such a gift. And I think we take, um, we take for granted the fact that we know a lot of this stuff and we think because people have been using alcohol or drugs, like I said earlier, that they know how it impacts their brain, how they know how it impacts, um, you know, their social system and how it affects their mental health and all this other stuff. And they or don't. I, usually, most of the time, I find them being very grateful for education around the topic, that it's stuff that they didn't know, and it's very helpful to support them in their treatment process. Um, you do not just provide education for clients. You provide education for family members or significant others of the client. That was our most famous group and most well attended and most talked about uh, with best feedback was the family group we used to hold every Sunday. So every Sunday afternoon, um, clients could receive um, guests or visitors. And at this, so, so at that time, you know, family members might come in and they might just go to group with their client and then spend some time after group together. Or sometimes like the client might spend time with their children while family members went to group. So we tried to make it, you know, flex. I mean, the, the clients already had a lot of this information. So, but we wanted to make sure that the family members got it. And hopefully that makes sense to you why 
we would be educating family members, right? Because if our if we're teaching our clients to, um, you know, look at relapse prevention, look at their um, support um, environments, we can't send them back to an environment that's unhealthy. We can't send them back to an environment where people are still using all the time. We can't send them back to an environment where they're still blaming the client for their use and all of maybe the poor choices that the clients made because families get super affected by the, the addiction and the choices of uh, the person with the addiction. And so family members had a lot of questions and they had a lot of feelings and they had a lot of things they needed to kind of process. So it was extremely helpful to do that. So if your facility or where you're working doesn't have a family group, you know, maybe it's something you can talk to with your clinical director or, or um, you know, the president or CEO of your facility and see what you could do to get something started because it's absolutely essential, especially if the client's going to go back once they leave treatment and go back and live with that family system. The family has to understand that things are different now, right? And how they can be supportive and maybe some areas that they might need to change to be supportive of the client. So what we try and do <clears throat> is, you know, make sure that the client is definitely educated, but we need to make sure that the whole social support of the client, the whole system is provided education so that they um, get that needed knowledge and understanding to also support the recovery process of the client. Um, community resources usually involve um, a variety of support groups. Um, you know, most of you, if you're working in treatment facilities now, you pro I don't, I, I don't know if this still happens, but we used to have like um, self-help groups come into the residential treatment facilities and hold a group or, or hold, um, yeah, their group basically, um, and then our clients could join them. But a lot of the times we also took our clients to meetings just to expose them to a different support. Um, so things like AA, Al-Anon, um, sometimes Alateen, depends if you're working in an um, adult residential facility or a teen facility. Um, Narcotics Anonymous, Smart Recovery was always really popular when I was in residential, um, when I was working in residential treatment. Um, that refuge recovery was very popular. I don't know uh, how, I haven't gotten, I haven't heard a lot of feedback on that, but um, it was very popular because it wasn't um, based in, they didn't use the word God. I'm just going to say it because that's always what turned our clients off, even though they would use God, but they would also say things like what, however, your vision of your spiritual power, or your higher power is. Um, people got really turned off by that piece. So that's why SMART was so popular because it's really just a version of CBT. Um, and refuge recovery was um, like a Buddhist type uh, philosophy. So some people really found that more helpful. But again, when I was talking about that three ring binder you should have, you should have all these meetings like where they're held in town what time they're held, you know, if they're holding nowadays, right, they might be holding them uh, through Zoom. Um, though my experience with um, people in treatment is that they much prefer to be in person, right? But during the pandemic, it was like either no group or, you know, group by Zoom. So people sort of adapted, but um, some of the statistics do show that relapse rates went up quite high um, during the pandemic, probably for a variety of reasons, I'm sure. I think everybody was sort of going a little um, off their rocker during the pandemic. But um, now that things are a little bit more back to normal, people are going to face-to-face -face meetings. I wonder if they're still holding, you know, some Zoom meetings here and there for people who may not have accessibility, um, as well as in person. Um, treatment providers could include, um, you know, talking to your clients about halfway house. Um, it, like if you're in residential treatment, they're about to leave, is the next step halfway houses for them? Is it outpatient services? Is it intensive outpatient services? You know, um, what's the, those next steps? So helping educate your client 
on the different um, treatment options that would be next for them, if any. So uh, there's formal client education. And a lot of the times this is done through, you know, a type of lecture, um, a didactic class with readings, having discussions, using films, sometimes even just using the internet, right? I use YouTube all the time um, in my classes, these little quick video clips to sort of support what I'm trying to educate and show. It's just a different way of saying the information that I'm saying and hearing it through somebody else's voice can be really powerful. Plus the visual images of videos and whatever you can find on the internet that's good, you know, it's um, reputable literature. Um, seeing the visual of it is really helpful for people too, right? So when you use a film to support what you're saying, you know, verbally, you can use the film to support things visually, right? Because people learn differently. Most people actually learn better experientially, like doing it either hands-on or going through it, go going through whatever they're trying to learn. So types of information you can teach um, is endless, really. Like I said, get yourself a little focus group with your clients and ask them, what do you want to learn? They're, they're going to be your best teacher, right? We're talking about education and they're going to be your best teacher because they're going to be able to tell you what they're interested in learning about. And they're also going to be able to bring that experiential piece to your group as well. But you can teach them the knowledge, the information, and you can do it, you know, in a fun, creative way as well. Um, but definitely you want to approach all kinds of different information on alcohol and other drugs. You definitely want to talk about mental health. You know, and, and yes, I know most of you are probably not competent to treat mental health, but there's a difference between being able to just talk about the symptoms of depression and talk about the symptoms of anxiety, to talk about some of the ways that people can get support around depression and anxiety. Um, and that's not treating somebody, right? That's giving information, that's talking about it. How could they recognize if they have depression? And if they do, if they come to you and they say, you know what, your group was really helpful. I feel like I might have depression. That's a way for you to make a referral maybe to the mental health center to say, yeah, well, well let's see. Let's, you know, get somebody who's qualified to do an assessment with you. And let's see if we can get you some support around that. Uh, Self-help groups is another way to get, um, to teach information or any community service agency. The only thing you really wanna make sure is that whatever you're presenting, whatever information, whatever topic, always make sure you're respectful. Are you not talking down to anybody? You're not um, you know, uh, presenting things in a way that would encourage stigma or discrimination, right? Um, Make the information that you're teaching understandable, careful not to use a ton of acronyms, you know, like AOD or, you know, whatever, COD, because they're not going to know that. You and I might know that professionally because we talk about it all the time or we read about it all the time, but our clients don't, right? Try not to use big, ginormous words for a simple concept. Try and keep it as easy for the average Joe right? Think it, you know, and don't, it, I'm not trying to say that, you know, our clients aren't intelligent because our, I actually believe our clients are highly intelligent. Uh, what I'm trying to say is like, say there was um, an accountant in your room, right? They were just there to observe your group. They had no AOD issues. They were just an account. Like they're not going to understand your, your words, your, um, your lingo, if you will, right? Just like if we walked into an accountant's office, we would be like, what? Debits and expenditures and what? Because that's not our profession. That's not our thing. So try and just make it obviously respectful, understandable, and be very careful about, um, you know, being sensitive to people's culture, what people might believe in, how they might have been raised. So you, you know, you just have to have an awareness and there's going to be times you might, you know, just cross a line and hopefully a client will come up to you and say like that, you know, that felt, you know, strange for me. It felt uncomfortable for me, you know, be open to those conversations and see where you might be able to learn and make a difference and, and certainly take accountability for how you might've impacted somebody. Um, 
because sometimes you're just going to do it. We, we can't always know how it's going to impact people. So just be open to that and just try and be aware of it and careful with it. Um, so I talked about earlier lakes. Everybody learns different, differently. I have found the best way, at least um, my college students, the best way they learn is by actually experiencing things like what that we're talking about or feeling things, right? So this um, experiential piece might be, you know, I might be talking about, like, I'll go back to extent, uh, um, existential therapy. And so what I might do is pull a client a client, pull a student from the class and um, do like a, a mock counseling session with them where I'll do existential, uh, existential therapy with them. And so they're going through it, right? They're experiencing it, but they're also feeling it as well. So if you're actually the participant with me, you know, it's, it's quite the learning experience. But even as the observers in the classroom, they're like, oh, this is how like it really happens in real life, right? And so, you know, I teach a theories class. And so I go through each of the theories and I choose a new person every time. I don't have the same person every time. So everybody hopefully gets a chance to go through um, the different theories and therapies themselves. People are, I'm also, I'm very visual. Uh, when I see things, I can just sort of like take a snap picture in my mind and that's how I can remember things. Um, so people are very visual. If you can talk about a concept and then show the concept, you know, mnemonic devices, that works really well for my college students, especially when I have to teach um, biopsychology or I have to teach the brain. They're like, neurons, axon, myelon sheets, like, what the heck is that? And I'm like, yeah, I'm right there with you. I find it confusing too. So we, I come up with some mnemonic devices for them to help them remember it. That's visual. Um, auditory is really just listening and hearing the information. Some people really do well with that. If they hear it, they remember it. It just sinks right in. Um, I don't happen to be one of those people, but... Um, you know, this is the first webinar that we actually have me on camera, and it makes me think right now, is that a nice blend of auditory because you're listening to me, but visually you're seeing me too. So when I talk about something, you know, I might use a hand gesture or something that just clicks with you. It helps you see me talking about the concept, so you're getting a blend of the two, and it might be more impactful than just listening to me because in the past all of our webinars were just auditory so hopefully this nice blend um, works for people um what this this slide is interesting because um it talks about the fact that a lot of you that if you've gone through any type of substance use disorder uh, training program, like you've gone to school for substance use or addiction, you don't get any, you know, student teaching practicum, really. You, you should, like, if you go through my program, you go through a practicum. And a lot of the times when a student gets placed in a practicum, the facility will ask them to run a group. So that's their first, you know, foray into teaching a group. And everybody's always super nervous about it. Um, but a lot of programs don't have that student teaching piece built in to the curriculum. So a lot of you don't even know how to run a group or you're not comfortable running a group because you've never done it. You don't know how to do it. It's not something that comes naturally to you. So it can make you nervous. Um, it can also make you feel discouraged. And really it's, you know, it's not something I knew I was good at until I did it. And once I started doing it, I'm like, I really love this. And it seemed, I seemed to be effective with the students. So, you know, am I the same? I, I guess what I'm trying to say, like, am I the same presenter and educator I was nine years ago? No, not at all. Because I've learned from the first time I did a group to today like, wow, I would change my style a million times over. So don't, you know, try and like, you know, feel your discouragement, but let it go because you're going to learn along the way. Don't be so hard on yourself. Have a plan, have how you're going to, um, you know, run your group, what your topics are, your objectives, et cetera, and follow your plan and then get feedback. 
you know, how's this going for everybody? Ask questions. Is everybody following me? Could I say this a little differently? And, you know, um, get evaluations at the end. And as hard as those evaluations can be, you know, take your ego out of it and really just look at it, look at the information for what it is. Can you take something out of it and learn and grow as a presenter? Um, right. A lot of you guys are going to be left on your own <laughs> to find your own resources for running a group. Um, so somebody might say, I want to learn about the brain. And then you're going to have to go out and find the information. Um, so that can feel discouraging, but do your best, right? Always go to reputable sites. Ask people. Ask people that are at Nahatica, right? Ask people that are in the profession. What are some reputable sources for, you know, a group on the brain? And I'm sure between all of your resources you have at your fingertips, you'll be able to have people help you with what you might be able to use for information. Um, what I've found is that a lot of people tend to over rely on commercially available films to teach, right? So counselors have this sort of theory like, well, I'm not a teacher and I know that Father Martin can definitely teach better than I can. So instead of teaching on the brain, I'm just going to throw a video in of Father Martin and let, you know, the clients just watch that. It's not as effective, right? And I've said, you know, using film in your group can be very helpful, but use little clips, right? It's so much more impactful to see a live human, this warm body in, in the group with you presenting because they feel like they can ask you questions. They can engage with you. There's that human experience um, versus just throwing in a CD or DVD. I just realized how I just dated myself. <laughs> CD. Um, so... You know, try, and, and it's not to say that I've never used um, Pleasure Unwoven in an introduction to addiction course, but I play bits and pieces of it, right? I try and take out what I think is impactful and talk about the rest. And like I said earlier, when and where you teach is irrelevant. It's just that you teach. Um, use lots of different resources. Get creative. Um, my experience has been that clients really like to get hands on. So if they can draw, write, paint, color, they're into it. They, they like it. And for a lot of our clients, it's actually helpful to have something in their hands while they're listening to you. Um, remember that education can occur one on one, psychoeducational groups. Um, treatment groups are generally tend to be a little bit different. That's more um, like group therapy versus education. But um, community meetings can be very helpful for education. So the most important and appropriate time to introduce education is when the client is ready for the material. So you might teach a group on the brain, you know, three times a week, and a client might sit in there and they're just not ready. They haven't heard you. And then after three weeks, they go to your brain group again, and they start asking questions. They're engaged, and you're like, wait a minute, what happened? You know, like you've been to this group a hundred times. What's what's clicked for you now? It doesn't matter what's clicked for them now, just that it clicked. And every time you teach, whether that person is really ready to hear that material and make those changes, you're planting a seed. And that is essential with education. You just need to plant a seed because sometimes they might be ready, but then they hear something that's just really overwhelming and too much and they have to shut down for a time period and they might go back to it, you know, and just respect that they shut down at that time and be gentle and just keep going at planting that seed. Um, I've talked, already talked about lesson plans, right? Making sure you have um, it set up. This is what I'm going to teach. These are the materials I'm going to use. This is how long it's going to be. Um, but just make sure you have an idea or at least a sense of what one wants to teach and how you should go about achieving that desired learning. These are just different ideas of groups you could run. There's a million gazillion. So just some ideas for you here. I, like I said, the brain was always a really, really popular one in family. The family uh, piece of it, like what um, the different family roles, clients love that. Right. And um, Claudia Black does a lot of great, great work on family roles. So if you're going to have to run a group pretty soon, um, run run one on that. 
relapse prevention is its own sort of um, beast, but the reality is it's, it's something that you need to be ready for. It needs to be talked about. Not every single client is going to relapse, but a majority do. So making sure, you know, you have that education there for them. You're gentle and sensitive about it. Um, a, when clients have relapsed and they've had a previous experience with client education, they might feel very know-it-all and become resistant to further education. Um, don't see it as a resistance towards you. Don't take it personally. Sometimes like a quiz can identify what a client knows versus what they think he or she knows. So doing like a pre-test and then a post-test, that can be kind of fun too. Um, I think we've talked a lot about these, but I just wanted to give you some films that I like to use. Um, Pleasure Unwoven, Lost in Woonsocket, Anonymous People, 28 Days. These are all great, great films to use with clients. They've always had a really impactful um, experience with them. It's the feedback I've gotten from students and clients. Um, always have at least 10 handouts appropriate for alcohol and other drug and mental health information just so clients can take it with them. And um, things you can do to help prepare uh, for educating clients. I think we've talked about all this, so I think we're good to go. It's like just making the three ring binder, having a lesson plan, um, talking about the different resources in the community. Discussion question. Okay, so first discussion question. How do you define client education? So client education, what I need you guys to remember is the provision of information to individuals and groups concerning alcohol and other drug abuse and the available services and resources. Um, design of group ideas, start with an icebreaker, have everybody introduce themselves. You know, it's always a good way to um, break the ice and get people comfortable with each other so that you can hopefully get them sharing during the group. Discuss that triggers might happen, that's important. Um, and then have a plan for what you're gonna do if somebody does get triggered. Like I talked about earlier, have maybe a co-facilitator who could take them out of the room while you complete the group. You don't want to leave a client alone, you, you know, um, if they get triggered, they should leave, but you don't want to leave them alone. Um, make a list of stay busy activities. Like I said, um, it's a good idea for them to always have something in their hand. Even if you have Play-Doh just kicking around, you know, give everybody a little ball of Play-Doh while you start your group so they can just have that to kind of use as a stress ball or play with. Prepare your speech. What are you going to talk about? What points do you want to hit? What are your objects, objectives for the group? And challenge their perceptions. Don't be afraid of a little challenges, challenges and, and resistance. All right? It's not a bad thing for somebody to say, I don't agree with you. You know, really have fun with that. You know, thank God you don't agree with me. I'm tired of hearing myself just speak. What's on your mind? And encourage them to talk about it. And, um, if what they have to say is, you know, what they have to say is meaningful, but what if what they're trying to say is actually has some errors in it, you know, try and correct them gently. Don't go into it with you're wrong, I'm right, but, um, you know, have fun with it. Have them reflect on their role models. Who would you, you know, who do you admire? Who would you like to be? All right, so when you are sober and clean, you know, who, who is it you'd like to emulate? What do you like about them? This helps them stay on practice. Um, I do a lot of practicing mindfulness uh, with my students, um, particularly because it's something that I feel like it's important to me, but I think it has so many benefits in so many different areas of a life. So, you know, go easy. Don't do this like 40 minute trans, you know, transcendental meditation with them, you know, start with like a one minute or two minute exercise that just helps bring their awareness to their thoughts. Have them make a plan for their self care, what they're going to do to take care of themselves that day, that minute, that next hour, that week, you know, so short term and long term. 
And we've talked about the cultural diversity piece, but, you know, making sure um, that you have accurate information when providing education relating to diversity, be sensitive, be respectful, um, and always be open to learning and changing. There's so many different cultures, it's really impossible for us to know them all. Um, so be open to being educated by our clients about their unique cultures. Um, yeah, there's def de definitely different things you can do um, with topics on cultural diversity. You could actually do your own training on just cultural diversity. Um, but just here are um, some recommendations to achieve cross-cultural uh, awareness in the client. Design an educational program that is, um, you know, shows uniqueness to all of the different cultures. Provide cultural knowledge as much as you can or ask the participants to provide it. Right? Ask each, each person what culture means to them, how they would define it, and what example they have in their life about culture. That will help you learn a lot about culture in your group and your participants. Um, always try everything you do, be consciousness raising. Right, You want to help people become aware of learned cultural biases um, and try and do that through a lot of cognitive learning with, again, those experiential exercises. And that is the end of the presentation. I'm sorry I went over an hour here. <laughs> again, if you have any questions, please um, go back. You can email me. Again, probably wouldn't call because you won't get called back from me for a long time. So um, email me or you can also email anybody at Nahatika. Um, I really appreciate all your time. It's always my pleasure to present uh, the core functions with you. So that's it. Thank you.